Good morning, everybody. How are you all today? Awesome. It is so good to see you today at Grace Church. Let me welcome you. Let me welcome our online church family. We love our church family online, don't we? Glad that they're here with us today. And if you are new, you've been visiting for a short time, I want you to know that we are glad that you are here today. Uh, Welcome to Grace, and you're at a place where you can belong. So thank you for your presence today. We're on part five of our series, What is the Gospel? And before I I get into that, I just want to take a moment to see, do we have any veterans in our service today? If you're a veteran, would you stand so we could recognize you? Thank you, veterans. We appreciate our veterans. Amen. Amen. And it is good to see Mr. McGrath back in the house with us today. I wanted to go visit him in the hospital, but he said, no visiting. Hospital hair is real. (laughs) So we're glad he's here today. Uh, So we're on part five. We're wrapping up our series, What is the Gospel? And it has been uh, my intention and my hope and what I've tried to do in these messages about what is the gospel is to just pour out through these three parables that Jesus tells what the gospel is, to capture various glimpses of the good news that Jesus came to share uh, with us. And uh, one of the things that isn't talked about, Jesus, of course, did this because he was responding to the mutterings of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Uh, But one of the things that's a theme in this that is not specifically stated, but it's there, is home. Would you say the word home? Home is a word that is filled with uh, desire, a longing. It is a powerful word. It is a, a, like a candle that's lit in the dark that draws us. What are the thoughts, the feelings, the desires, and the emotions that come to you when you think of the word home? home. And I realize as I say this that for, for, for some people, for whatever reason, warm is not a place, uh, home is not a place of warm feelings. Home uh, was not a place of long or belonging or joy. Home was a place of ugliness, abuse, and brokenness. And uh, many people experience that at home. But the thing is, even though that's true, there is still a longing within a person's heart who've experienced those things from their home, where they long for home, a true home. I've seen on several occasions uh, people who are sick and near death in the hospital, they offer one simple request. They have one thing that they desire. I want to go home. I want to go home. Because the hospital or the hospice facility, though it can provide better care in those late stages of life, it's just not home. I watched this with my sister, knowing that her time on earth was coming to an end. And she made plain her desire, I want to go home. She came home and would set up a hospital bed for her because it would be easier to help her set up and lay down and everything else. And she got in at one time and she got out. She says, I want my bed. <laughs> and so we dragged that thing out and set her bed back up for her. Home is this powerful, instinctual draw in all of us. We have this innate desire, longing for home. And people spend money all the time, every year, to go home, don't they? Charmaine was born, my wife, Uh, was born in South Africa, Pretoria, South Africa. She's the daughter of missionaries. And Africa calls because Africa is home. I told her one time, I said, if I die before you do, I said, take some of the money that we have. I said, cremate me, fly to Africa, And spread my ashes there so that I will be where your heart is. I I even told her one, she's she's, she's like, you know, is God calling you to be a missionary? Because if God's calling you to be a missionary to Africa, she she would be on the plane already. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a powerful, the calling to home. And now we're coming up on the holidays. And what, a, what do we associate with holidays? There's food, feasting, right? And home. That is part. It goes together. Uh, people gathered together, sharing, eating, ma- having joy, making memories. And it evokes images and memories of feast and home. Holidays do because they go together. And we hear this message. Advertisers feed this message to us all the time. And they are speaking directly to our hearts with their advertising. We don't even, we don't even realize how they are pulling on our hearts on this issue of home. And some people think, well, maybe this will be the year. Maybe this will be the year where, because we have this deep longing to connect. Maybe this will be the time where I can reconnect and I can experience again some of those things because whatever it was that I used to have is, is not here anymore. That moment in time, that feeling, that intense longing. And then we try to recreate the moment, you know, and, and it just doesn't fulfill. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever heard anybody say that? It's just not the same. If you felt that, if you've said that, if you've heard someone say that, it's, it's really what it is, what you're hearing is something that Martin Heidegger, who's a philosopher, he says it's something that we all experience at different times in life and different moments. And he called it Unheimlichkeit. Or Unheimlichkeit, <laughs> if that makes it better. It translates as eeriness or uncanniness, but it literally it means away from home. In other words, there is something about our existence in this life and in this world. And for all the good and the beauty that there is in this world, and there is good and there is beauty in this world, don't misunderstand, yet there is still this eeriness or uncanniness that we experience that we are here, we are in this world But it's not home. And people experience this especially during the holidays. They have this sense of, I'm away from home. We can look at our world, and many of us have, I've I've heard people say this. We look at the world going on and some of the, because for all the good and the beauty in the world, there's a whole lot of ugly and evil, amen? I mean, it just is, let's be honest. There's a lot. Things happening in our, our, across our, our world right now, in our nation, and, 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 it, there's, and it's just like it's not supposed to be this way. We, we gather at the foot of a grave of someone we love, and they died young. You know, at least when they're older, we go like, they lived a good life, but when they're young, it's like it's just not supposed to be this way. And even when they've lived a good life, there's this part of us that, that aches because now love has come to an end, and we long for a love that doesn't end. Well, they loved you to the end. Yes, they did, but now they're gone. What am I supposed to do with this? Because there's nothing, no one to receive that from me. We see injustice in the world. Maybe this family experience will help to express what it is I'm talking about by Unheimlichkeit. One of our family trips, it was I think in 2004, my family took a trip to Indiana in a 15-passenger van, the most uncomfortable trip I've ever been on in my life. Bench seats, oh, it was horrible. Don't ask my wife about it because she'll tell you. Um, we decided on this trip, we were going up, and we decided that we were going to stop, uh, go by and visit uh, Grandma Hill in Jonesville's home where she lived. She was long gone. Uh, but that's how we knew her growing up. It was Grandma Hill in Jonesville. It just kind of rolled off our lips, you know, Grandma Hill in Jonesville. And so we're in the van, and we're talking about going by and seeing the place. And, and it was a place, of course, with memories for us as a child. It was our great-grandmother, by the way. Uh, and, uh, but it was especially drawing for my mom who was with us because Grandma Hill in Jonesville was like a mom to my mom. And so there's this... This warmth of emotion and beauty as we're talking about it on the ride there. And I don't know what we were expecting as our anticipation levels grew as we drew near this place, this home in Jonesville. But when we got there, what we saw was not what we expected. See, Grandma Hill and Jonesville's home was a small home located right by the railroad tracks. And 
you could sit out on the front porch and you could uh, see the train and hear the train and feel the train as it passed close by. I have a picture of my mom. That's my mom up there featured on the center left. And then if you look over to the left past the brick columns, you see a few trees and bushes, and you can see the railroad track that ran right by the house. And so uh, many great memories and thoughts and expectations. And so we're on this ride there, and we're thinking, you know, warm moments and fuzzy feelings, right? And we get there, and the house is dilapidated, overgrown. It is, I mean, what? It, I'll just simply say it this way. I don't know what we expected, but what we experienced when we saw the home, it, it, just, it just sucked the wind out of us. It was a blow. It just was like a, a heavy, cold, wet blanket. And, and the atmosphere in the, the vehicle and in my heart, just it just, wow. I mean, you know, it was just, and that was it. That was Grandma Hill in Jonesville. And it, whatever it was, it was not anymore. Brian Duncan is one of my favorite singers. He has a song called When I Think of Home. And in it, he says, he has these words. He says, the seasons and the scenery keep changing. And isn't that true? The seasons and the scenery keep changing. I, I, I had memories on Facebook pop up recently. And I mean, like eight years ago, I didn't have this white stuff all in my hair and in my beard. Eight years ago, this is what pastoring does to you. It, the seasons and the scenery keep changing, he says. And he makes a note, he says, my home is so far away. Because when I think of home, it's, it's not really here. Heimlichkeit. C.S. Lewis in his sermon series, The Weight of Glory, said this. He said, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fancy, but the truest index of our real situation. Do you hear what he's saying? That feeling that that we capture something, we see a glimpse of it, and we, we can't go back and grab it again. It just happens. And then it's like we're on a door, on one side of a door, longing to see the other side, and, and, but somehow it's just beyond our grasp that there's something there, but we can't get hold of it. Unheimlichkeit. We are away from home. That's what he's describing. And our hearts long for something that is real that satisfies, and that lasts. A love that can't be lost. An escape from death. The triumph of justice over wrong. And while we see glimpses of that here, the truth is those things will never be found here. They're not. And when we look for them, we end up disappointed and unsatisfied. Just like Jonesville, Indiana. I have a question for you. <clears throat> if we are made for this world, why do we leave it? If we are made for this world, why doesn't, real, doesn't it really truly satisfy our deepest desires and longings? If we are made for this world, why do we have to search so hard to find a place to fit in and belong? Tim Keller said it this way. By the way, if you know uh, Tim Keller, I, I love Tim Keller. Bless the Lord, he's with the Lord now. This year he went, and he's the one who has had such a profound influence on my understanding of these parables. We're getting to them in a moment. This is the introduction, the longest introduction ever. Tim Keller said this, if this world is all there is, why do we feel out of place in a world where there's injustice, even though all you have in nature is the strong eating the weak? So, it, simply put as this, nature is what nature is. It's strong eating the weak. If you don't believe it, watch a nature video, you'll see it's pretty clear. That's just this world. And if we're not, if we're made for this world, we have nothing to complain about because that's just life for us. 
But if we're made for a different world, there's something in us that will cry out and say, I'm not home. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. The three parables that Jesus tells speak directly to this issue, unheimlichkeit. I had to look that up to pronounce it correctly. There is a lost sheep, there is a lost coin, and there is a lost son. They are lost. They are away from where they ought to be. They're not home where they belong. And it reminds us of this important biblical truth. We are lost and we long for home. This is what happened to the younger son. He was lost, he was far from home, and he had a longing to return. This uh, important biblical theme of exile is echoed throughout the Scripture, and it begins in the Garden of God, in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, where we were created by God, we were created for God, we walked with Him, we talked with Him, we had fellowship with Him in the Garden of God. But then our great-grandparents couldn't even keep one law. They couldn't keep one command. Don't do this one thing. That's all God said. Don't. Have you ever noticed that with kids? Don't do this, and what do they want to do? That one thing, right? They couldn't do the one thing. And because of that, they were exiled from the garden of God. They were exiled from, if you will, excommunicated from the presence of God. They sinned against God. They decided to go on their own and do their own thing and be their own God. And so they were exiled. And paradise was lost. We, in them, were exiled from our home. And we have been wandering and trying to to find our way back home ever since. And I know it's not easy for anyone to sit here and say, I'm not the prodigal, you know, to say that. It's easy to say, I'm not the prodigal son. It's easy to say that. I'm not him. That's someone else. I'm not the lost sheep. I'm not the lost coin. Someone else may be, but I'm not. Tim Keller in The Prodigal God said this, it is no coincidence that story after story contains the pattern of exile. The message of the Bible is that the human race is a band of exiles trying to come home. The parable of the prodigal son, he says, is about every one of us. The parable of the prodigal son is about you, and it's about me. And what is fascinating about these parables is is this. When the sheep goes missing, guess what? There is a shepherd who goes looking for the lost sheep who gets it, who brings it home, and there's a celebration, there's a feast, because the one that was lost is now found, is back home. When the woman loses her coin, she searches intently in the house, and you have to picture a a, a small home with no windows, using a little olive oil lamp, probably on a floor that's dirt with some hay on top. You can imagine what trying to find. It's like a needle in the haystack, right? And she searches intently until she finds it. When she finds a coin, she celebrates and she rejoices because the thing that was lost, that mattered, that had value, has now been found. It's back where it belongs. Rejoice and celebrate with me. But when we get to the lost son... Who went on the search and the rescue? Who went to find the lost son to bring him home? Whose whose responsibility was it to bring the young lost son who was exiled and bring him home? The answer to that question was well known to Jewish audiences. Since the time of Cain and Abel, am I my brother's keeper? And God's like, yes, you are. (laughs) Yes, it's your responsibility. The older brother didn't care about his younger brother, didn't care that he was exiled, he was away from home, that he was hungry. He was content to let him stay lost that way. My friends, I have to ask a question for us as a church. This is at the heart of the church and who we are because it's at the heart of Jesus and the church that he gave birth to. Are we content to let the lost stay lost because 
we're home and we're okay? Are we content with that? Or do we have within us the burning heart of Jesus for lost things? When the younger brother came to his senses, he, he knew he needed to go back home, right? He knew, I, I need to go back home. There's food there. There's, they're cared for. I, I need to get back home. But how could he get back home? He's, he was in exile by his own choosing. J.R.R. Tolkien. See, that's three now. Lewis, Tolkien, and, and Keller. You got all three today. He said this. He says, we all long for Eden and are constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature is soaked with the sense of exile. This young man is soaked with the sense of exile. And he is longing to return to home, to return to Eden, to be with his father. But he had insulted his father, disgraced him. He placed the family in a precarious situation financially and socially. And most importantly, he understood this one fact. Because when he thought about coming home, he said to himself, he said, I am not worthy to be called your and when he got home and he saw his father, he said, I, I've sinned against heaven and you. I am not worthy to be called your. In other words, he realized that because of what he had done, he had lost familial standing. He had no standing as family because of his actions. His actions, his sin exiled him and alienated him from the father. So his best hope was... Take me back as a hired hand. That's all he could hope for. Let me be a hired hand. And do you know what this lost younger son needed? He needed an older brother who loved him, who cared for him. A, younger, a brother who, who cared so much for him that we, he would leave his home and go out in exile himself to find the son who was in exile. And if necessary, and whatever at the cost, to bring that son back home. This, this younger brother needed, just like the, the, the lost around Jesus, the sinners and the tax collectors, they needed an elder brother. But they got Pharisees. Thank God. Jesus came. We don't get a Pharisee for an elder brother. We get the Son of God who left heaven and came to earth. He, he came into exile for us. And He paid the ultimate price to redeem us and to bring us back home so that we could have family standing again. And He was crucified. He suffered outside the gates. He was the outcast. He was cast out so that we could be brought in. And on the cross, he paid the price with his life for our sins. That we lost our standing as sons and daughters of God. Because of Jesus, our standing is restored. And we're brought home. Isn't that good news? And see, that's, that's when the party begins. Did you notice that in the story? Every time... Something lost is found and brought home. There's a party. L listen to the story, now, just a portion of it. The father said to his servants, because the younger son had come back home, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate good times come on right yes and when the older pharisaical brother complained about it he looked at him in love he went out to this son and invited him to come in to be a part of the celebration because everything i have is yours we had to celebrate and be glad he said because this brother of yours was dead is alive again he was lost and is found. Listen, what do we do when we get together as families? We eat and we celebrate, right? We, we, we partay because it's the thing to do. Special occasions call for a feast and celebration. 
And the Bible says that when lost sons and daughters come home, it is time to celebrate. In fact, one of the most important things, key things in a life of a church that indicates that their heart is where it needs to be and they are on mission is that they rejoice that the lost are coming home and they are involved in the mission of God to see that happening. In feasts in biblical times, not like ours today. Slave all day cooking a Thanksgiving meal, right? Most ladies will go, "Uh uh-huh. Hours upon hours cooking that meal. And you sit down and 30 minutes to an hour later, it's over with. Oh, I'm sorry, i got to go now, right? And they're gone. Feast in biblical times lasted for hours. It would get dark. There's no need to, you couldn't do any more work. So let's all get together and feast. Let's celebrate. I mean, wedding feast, they were like a week long. I couldn't afford that. For now, our feast is around the Lord's table, communion, the Lord's supper. That's where we feast. But I need to make you aware of something very important. At that feast, today's not a day for communion. I thought about us doing it just because of this. But at that supper, we remember what the Lord has done for us. We remember the price that He repaid. We remember the body that was broken, and we remember the blood that was shed, right? We remember what it cost Jesus to to bring us back home into the family, to restore our standing. But here's the truth. We're not home yet. And, And communion and the Lord's Supper is just a small taste and glimpse of what awaits us when we finally get home. There is going to be a celebration unlike anything the world has ever seen on that day when Christ returns because it will be the fulfillment of all the ages. In Matthew 19, Jesus talked about it. He called it He said, at the renewal of all things. And and he uses the word uh, genesis in it. It's the regenesis. The genesis was the beginning. The regenesis is going to be the the new beginning or the renewal of all things. And how, how our hearts long for the renewal of all things. They do. He talked in Matthew 8, 11. He says, many will come from the east to the, and the west and will take their places at the feasts with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Man, we are going to partay in the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you. And how our hearts long for the lost, what is lost, paradise lost to be restored. But see, Jesus promises us that that day is coming. There will be no more sin, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more parting at the regenesis in history. The former things will pass away. God will make all things new. Death will be defeated and swallowed up in sweet victory. Our eyes, with our eyes, we will see Jesus Jesus said that the pure in heart shall see God. Our faith will become sight. Can you imagine what that first hour, the first ten hours, the first hundred hours in heaven are going to be like? And by the way, it's not about us going to heaven. It's about heaven coming to us. Because John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus, the Jerusalem was the city of God coming down and the dwelling of God would be with men. Paradise was lost, but because of Jesus, paradise will be restored. And we will be home for all eternity, shouting, dancing, celebrating worship, awe, glory upon glory, joy upon joy, peace upon peace. Blessing upon blessing. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be there, and that's going to be pretty cool. 
David, Samson, Joshua, Deborah, Mary, the Samaritan woman, they're going to be there. And that's going to be really, really cool. But God himself will wipe the tears from our eyes. Did you hear that? See, that's only good news if you have tears in your eyes. If you don't have tears in your eyes, it's like, yeah, that's nice. But when you had experiences in this life and you've experienced doing high in the sky, and you hear that one day the dwelling of God is with men and he will be with them and he will be their God and they will be his people and he will wipe all tears from their eyes. When you hear that, there is a promise in that that your heart goes, yes, 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 God, come and make it so. Do it today. Paradise lost will be paradise restored. And we will be home. Home. Forever. Where you are loved, where you belong, where you're part of a community, where there is joy and there is a feast and a celebration. What a day that will be. How should we live now? I had a friend who posted on Facebook about if that's how Christians feel, that's fine that they feel that way about you know living for eternity, uh, but let's not put them in charge of anything now because they don't care about what's going on now is what, what they're saying is. And I'm thinking, you, you misunderstand what Jesus taught. If there is a Christian who doesn't care or isn't concerned about what's happening now, you've missed out on clearly what Jesus intended us to do. You know, we're supposed to be little outposts of the kingdom of God. We're, we're supposed to be creating glimpses and experiences of heaven on earth because we are the church. We are his ambassadors, and this is what we are called to do. And listen, our elder brother came and searched for us. Right? Right? Now, can I tell you that it was Jesus, but Jesus used someone named Jimmy in my life to do it? Who, who, did, who did Jesus use in your life to bring you home? How about when we walk out these doors, we go and be the person like Jesus in our lives to others. Amen? Let's... let's Listen, exile is real, and people, heart, people in their hearts are experiencing unheimlichkeit, and they are looking into various different things, trying to find something to fill that in their lives, that, that this away-from-home feeling. And there is only one answer to that, and that is Jesus Christ. We have the answer. So as we go out today... Let's proclaim him to the people that we know and share his love with others. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that because of him, though we were in exile, Jesus, you came for us, seeking and saving that which was lost. And at your own expense, you paid the price to restore us in familial standing so that we could be sons and daughters of God. And now you have given us this incredible, incredible hope that one day, right now, though we experience right now restoration as sons and daughters, but you have promised that one day our hearts will finally be at home because the kingdom of God will now make its dwelling here on this earth. There will be a regenesis, and God, our hearts long for that day. But until that day, until the time that you call us home or you make your kingdom here on this earth, would you help us to be like Jesus, who went out and shared the love of God and drew people into the kingdom of God. Jesus, give us your heart, we pray. Amen.